Do any of you know what a gold watch is? A blingy way to tell time, sure, but it used to mean so much more. A gold watch was traditionally given to a worker by their employer when they retired with more than 25 years of service to that company. This little tradition has almost entirely been forgotten, however. Why? Well, maybe it's the rising price of gold or the adoption of alternative timekeeping methods, but most probably it's simply because company loyalty is a thing of the past. How many people do you know that have been working with their current employer for more than 10 years? Well, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's actually 29% of people, which sounds suspiciously high until you consider that a vast majority of this group are made up of workers on the verge of retirement, which is important to remember for later. Amongst all workers in the US, the median was just over four years. In fact, multiple studies have suggested that full-time workers that stick with their employers for more than two years on average get paid 50% less. This is an unbelievably large gap, especially when you consider that the average of the loyal working group will be drastically inflated by senior executives in the C-suite who tend to have more tenure. In plain English, for the regular Joes like you and I, this 50% figure is likely understated. So why aren't companies stopping this? Surely, having to pay tens of thousands of dollars to advertise a position, interview candidates, onboard new staff, train them, and wait for them to get up to speed with their new role is not sustainable if it has to be done over and over again every two years, right? Well, you would think so, but there are a few reasons why companies don't care about employee loyalty anymore. An abundance of skill, standardization of tasks, globalization, broken corporate ladders, and of course, an ever-changing demand for different roles. So it's time to learn how money works and go into the terrifying minds of someone that works in human resources to find out what employers do actually value so that you can get the most out of the career that you will probably be working until you are 100 years old. The first factor that is ruining the appeal of company loyalty is the easiest one to see, and that is the changing demand for different roles. If you look at your local classified ads these days, you are likely going to find a lot more companies looking for DevOps engineers and far fewer companies looking for switchboard operators. As technology develops, it is creating new jobs while simultaneously making other jobs totally redundant. The rapid pace of this change in the modern world means that a lot of people are going to end their careers working jobs that didn't exist when they first started working. Naturally, if you are in a role that can easily be replaced by a machine or even just a piece of software, you are going to be shown the door pretty quickly, reducing the average tenure of the workforce. This goes both ways as well. A bookkeeper that realizes that they could earn twice as much as a social media manager is also likely to jump ship as well. The most sought after job amongst children these days is YouTuber. Go back just 20 years and people would think this is some kind of very specific plumber. I know this is not news to any of you, so I don't want to spend too much time on this factor, but do try to keep this in mind as we look at the other forces pushing companies away from valuing staff loyalty. Next up is the abundance of skills available to employers. Educational attainment is at all-time highs. A college graduate, for better or worse, is no longer a rarity. Companies do well for themselves by being open to these new hires for a few reasons. For starters, they are cheaper than their more tenured peers, but they naturally tend to be younger and more willing to put in overtime to make sure certain projects are delivered. An extreme example of this would be companies like the big four accounting firms. They offer widely recognized graduate programs that pay terribly and expect massive sacrifice. They offer these with the mutual understanding that almost none of the graduates will stay on with the company and instead seek out higher paying positions with a better work-life balance once they have committed their two years for their resume boost. A recent internal report found that Deloitte staff had a turnover rate of around 13% annually, potentially costing the business around $427 million a year in hiring and training expenses, as well as intangibles like project delays due to staff members leaving. This sounds bad, but both parties kind of know what they're getting into here. Deloitte gets a cheap pool of labor to bill out for for a few years, and those overworked juniors get to put the graduate program on their resume so they can find a better job with a regular company. The regular companies that hire these ex-graduate program staff also love this system for three reasons. For starters, surviving two years at a big four accounting firm is a good indication that they can handle a pretty big workload. They also come equipped with some genuinely useful insight. If a KPMG grad was doing consulting work in the pharmaceutical space and then later went on to work for Johnson & Johnson, they are going to be equipped from day one with the basics of how the business functions because they were directly involved with their projects in the past. Perhaps even more importantly is that they will have knowledge of how their competitors are operating. Now, I'm not talking about high-stakes corporate espionage or anything here, more just things like 
Oh, GSK streamlined their expense approval process by using this software. Simple little insights that can save multinational corporations millions. Now, this is not specific to just accounting firms. I only use them as one particularly egregious example. The truth is, businesses know that the best way to stay on top of their industry is to make sure they have a healthy supply of talent coming from their competitors. This becomes even more important when you consider the role of globalization. The rise in offshore service centers and a massive increase in skilled migration means that the pool of talent that companies have to choose from in almost every industry is wide and deep. It's not uncommon for companies to advertise even entry-level positions globally, especially since everybody is working from home anyway. Now, the third reason businesses love these outside hires, especially when it comes to more senior positions, is because it prevents catastrophic chain reactions in staffing. Imagine a company that made every effort to promote internally and only ever filled senior positions by promoting people from within the business. This actually sounds pretty great, but it can cause some problems. Let's say one day a senior manager in the business retires. Good for them. Anyway, a floor manager from one of the four departments the senior manager oversaw is chosen to replace them. And then a project manager is chosen to replace the floor manager. And a senior associate is chosen to replace the team manager. A lot of people in the business would be feeling pretty good about themselves. And in theory, this is the fairy tale example of climbing the corporate ladder. But you might already be starting to see the problems. Not only has this business lost a senior manager, but it now has four people in key roles that are totally new to their job all at the same time. No matter how much experience they have had, there is going to be some kind of learning curve involved in a new senior role. So. The business may be in a position where projects get delayed for months because an entire corporate vertical is completely out of action. Compare this with an alternative, where the senior manager gets replaced by an outside hire, and not only does this business not have to worry about all this nonsense, it might be pulling away a talented individual from a competitor. It's a win-win situation, although this just means that the business is winning twice. The employees can get f***. Now, you might argue that this is nothing new. But ironically, as businesses have been pushing for flatter organizational structures with less defined roles, it has become even harder, because it gets harder to map out who exactly does what. The classic line of, you're irreplaceable, has two meanings. Fortunately for companies, this external hire process has become a lot easier anyway, thanks to the standardization of tasks in the workplace. Let me ask a question to any office employees watching. What program do you use the most in your role? Probably email, right? If not, it will probably be some sort of Microsoft Suite product, and if you still don't fit into this category, then you're probably a programmer of sorts. The adoption of computers in the workplace has massively improved how productive we as individuals can be. A spreadsheet that might have taken a team of bookkeepers weeks to produce just two decades ago can now be created in one afternoon by an intern with Excel. Beyond maximizing man hours, it has also made most roles far more uniform. Whether you are in car sales, customer service, administration, accounting, or whatever else involves a computer, chances are that there is an industry standard software suite that gets used by most companies. So, an onboarding process that could have taken weeks to get someone up to speed with how a computer system works can now be as easy as, okay, so you say you have used Salesforce before? Here's your client list. Pick up the phone and start dialing. The most extreme example of this is the role of a bank manager. A few decades ago, being a bank manager was a big deal, almost on par with being a doctor or a lawyer. This was because bank managers had to decide who to give loans to and who not to give loans to. This might sound very easy in the age of credit scores, but back then, it took a very detailed understanding of how the business functions, the local economy, the national economy, regulations, and the bank's own financial position in order to underwrite the loan. Beyond this, bank managers were encouraged to develop strong relationships with local business and the community in general in order to gain their business. Well, I think we can make you this loan. Oh, that's fine. Will the bank need security? No, I don't think so. Fast forward to today, and a bank manager is a glorified customer service role. They don't make the decisions about who gets the loans and who doesn't. That gets handled by an offshore underwriting team that in turn just plugs numbers into a computer program to get an approval or a decline. Replacing a bank manager 40 years ago was a massive deal, and because the role relied so heavily on day-to-day -day experience and relationships, they almost needed to be replaced with someone else from the branch. Replacing a bank manager today is as simple as putting up a job posting and waiting for a line of new hopeful candidates to come knocking. Now if this all sounds depressing, just know that it doesn't have to be. Sure, the dream of having a nice stable job for a 40-year career is probably dead, but if anything, the current reality is refreshingly honest. 
Companies are there to get the most out of you until a better alternative comes along. And you are there to get the most out of a company until a better alternative comes along. Switch jobs. The stats don't lie. You will be better off for it. As we saw, the only way to climb up the corporate ladder is by jumping between them. Yes, employers are going to screw you. They are a business and not a charity. So screw them back. Keep that swanky LinkedIn profile looking sharp. Accept any certifications or training that your business will pay for, and don't fool yourself into thinking that you will be rewarded for this loyalty, because you simply won't be. All right, there are of course two other big factors at play here. All of the statistics and trends in this video explored have been for full-time employees. This whole situation would be a lot worse if it was to include the rapidly growing army of casual workers and gig economy contractors. I am going to make a video about that soon, so stay tuned. The other factor that we didn't explore was the increasingly service-oriented bullshit jobs that are being created every day which inherently have less staying power than the more traditional operational roles. Fortunately, I have already made an entire video on this point, so go check that one out to keep on learning how money works.